What would you ask Mike Norvell if you could ask him any question at ACC Media Day? You are Locked On Seminoles, your daily podcast on the Florida State Seminoles. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back into Locked On Seminoles. I am your host, Brian Smith. Please hit that like button and that subscribe, rate, and review. And thank you for making this your first listen each and every day. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down and the sports are not quite where we want them to be with football season on the horizon. Make sure you still check in with FanDuel because it is hooking you up with all kinds of opportunities like a boost or a bonus each and every day. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Today's show is going to focus on ACC Media Day on Monday, the opportunity for Mike Norvell and three of his players to come up to the podium and talk. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about the players in a little bit, but let's focus on Norvell first. If I had five questions, I, I mentioned in the opening, if you had one, well, I'm going to bring up five that I would like to ask. Some of these aren't the easiest for a coach, and I know Mike is good at deflecting like many college football coaches, but these are the five that I think are most important to me, looking at it from a journalist standpoint, looking at it for somebody that podcasts, and quite honestly, just a football fan in general, and following the Knowles for as long as I have, it's not hard to come up with why I asked some of these. So most of these probably won't surprise you, but I would imagine that he would, again, probably deflect on quite a few. This first one isn't – this This one's just genuinely interesting to me. I'm not – by the way, these aren't in any particular order, but this is the first one I put down. I'm curious why they went after DJ Uyunglele after they had so much success with Jordan Travis, a complete run-pass quarterback when they, when they got him, more run than pass when he initially transferred after one season at Louisville. What was the reasoning? Is there something about him – it's different because DJ had played four years that he just won a veteran. They went after Cam Ward too. It ended up signing Miami. Don't want anybody to tell you otherwise. They did. But he ends up with DJ. What would be the reason for that? Here's my thought process. When they had a situation last season where receivers were out, they could still throw the football. They showed it against Pittsburgh, who has, by the way, a very good pass rush pretty much every year. Norvell and his staff, I've talked about this several times. Ja'Kai Douglas, I believe it was 115 yards receiving. He's not a quote-unquote natural number one because he's not the biggest of guys. He's 5'9"-ish. Really fast, really twitchy, understood. But he's not the big body guy like Johnny Wilson, uh, that you know, 6'7", 6'6 and a half, whatever, 230-some pounds. So add him with Keon Coleman, that's about as dreamlike as you're going to get as a play caller and as a quarterback. But they made it work. I'm wondering if that game against Pittsburgh, where they threw the ball all around, despite having their top two receivers out, impacted that a little bit. They've evolved. They had guys that could make plays when he was at Memphis. And I should probably do a pod on their days as with quarterbacks at Memphis, but I'll get to that soon enough. I just found that odd that every kid that he signed has at least some kind of run pass ability out of the high school ranks even if they're not pure dual threats, like he may never have a guy as athletic as Jordan Travis again. He could have played receiver, free safety, maybe even corner. He's really, really athletic. I just found that interesting. Number two, do you have a cat for NIL for one player? This is a key question that no matter the coach, if I was at a press conference that I would ask, and I know they would lie through their teeth sometimes, but there's some guys that may not. Here's, here's why I bring it up. You put this one on a tee and just let them go at it, because I know that Florida State won't offer as much as some other schools. Like they don't pay near as much as Miami does to get a player. Miami will do anything to get a player to NIL. I know some of the numbers thrown around, like they'll often offer half again as much, if not twice as much as Florida State on some players. My opinion on what he would say, and, and I would agree if I'm right on this, if you do that with the high school kid, now I'm not talking about kids at NIL, Portal. Portal is a whole different animal from high school because they've already played college ball. So hear me out. I think Norvell would be a little hesitant to go too high, and I imagine he has a cap. He may not give me the number, but I think it would be something where he would talk about guys that are already here or another program, Memphis, Texas, whatever. They've earned through going to class, 
leadership council and different things like that they have to deal with, whether they're on or adhere to it, going to practices, lifting, getting up at 530 in the morning, all of those things. That's my gut. I could be wrong. If people want to comment on that on YouTube, fire away. But it's a really unique topic because people just assume you just throw money at kids and it, that's it. Believe me, it's a locker room issue. It's something I will talk about nonstop until I die, because as long as NIL is here, there will be greedy and there will be snippy kids because why did this kid get more than me, et cetera. It's a super fine line. And sometimes it's a slippery slope, no matter what you do, even if your intent is not to overpay. Opinions are opinions. You're not going to make everybody happy. So I, again, I think keeping it to a certain level, even if it costs you a recruit, I know you freeze is in a situation like that at Auburn right now where they're looking for a quarterback. He wouldn't go over a certain number, and that was it. And they, they lost Juju Lewis on that. He was like, okay, that's it. So sometimes you have to look at things a little bit differently. And Norvell has done a great job with it because it builds a culture. And that's why you win. So, that again, that would be a question I'd ask Kirby Smart that or any other, you know, Marcus Freeman. I, I'd care less. Brian Kelly, any coach in the country. That's something they got to think about. Where is our top? No matter the player, no matter the position, what is our top? It's something to think about. Three, the grant of rights. I'm sure he's sick of it. He's not going to comment too much on it, and he can't. But would it matter to you which conference you went to? I wouldn't say – I wouldn't ask him to like rank the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12. I wouldn't put him in that spot. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to get an answer anyway. But does it really matter to you as long as you're coaching football? Just open-ended. I'm just curious as a football fan what he would say because he's a guy that came up through the ranks, coached at Memphis, not exactly the most glamorous. His first major job is Florida State, and it might be his last. Maybe he's a guy that is happy just wherever he's at. I have no idea. Maybe he really wants to be in the Big Ten. Maybe he wants to be in the SEC. Maybe he would say that. I have no idea, but I think that would be a fun question to get an answer from. Here's one that – I think a lot of coaches would like to be asked. That's out of the five. This would be the one he liked the most. What did coaching at Memphis teach you? Now, here's something to think about. We're used to talking about Florida State and Florida, Miami, Georgia, Georgia Tech, Auburn, Alabama, schools in the Deep South that are tradition-rich programs, have big pockets of money, facilities are nice, big stadiums, all that kind of stuff that they have access to in one way, shape, or form. Booster clubs, all that. Memphis is a basketball school. Penny Hardaway played there. They've had some other guys go to the draft, et cetera, from that program. It's different. That's a very poor city. They don't necessarily have the greatest support. There's Tennessee fans there, Arkansas fans there, Ole Miss fans. Ole Miss is only like an hour or so from Memphis. So what did that teach you with recruiting? What did that teach you with how to assemble a roster and try to keep kids. What did it teach you in terms of bringing in a staff? Because you're not working with the same money to get guys. That would be a fascinating answer. He could probably go on for an hour about it. It would be a really unique situation. Final question I would have for Norvell. Where do you personally need to improve the most as a college football coach? Again, this is just put it on the tee and let him, let him go for it. He's a smart enough guy. That's a hard question. But he's a smart enough guy to pick something and just hit it and be done. But he could drag it out and mention two or three things. But I have no idea. Out of these, I have no idea where he would go. He may talk about development. He may talk about donor relations because whether we like it or not, that's as big a part of college football as anything. That's unfortunate. That's not changing, though. Could it be something with in-home visits or something with recruiting? Maybe dealing with the media? I don't know. But every coach, there's something like that you have to think about. And quite honestly, it's not an easy, easy topic to get into. But next up, we're going to talk about the players that are going to be with Norvell on ACC Media's Day. Um, it's it's an interesting group, and there's a couple of points that I want to make. That's next on Locked on Simmons. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down and we're waiting for the college football season to get going, sports aren't quite where they are, where, you know, where we want them to be. we got a few more weeks yet. But FanDuel has an opportunity for anybody to keep the sports going whenever you want. 
All you have to do is open the FanDuel app, dream up any bets that you want at any time, no matter your move. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all its customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and make the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the MLB. We've got three players going with Norvell to media. And by the way, from 3 to 3.30 is when Florida State will be going. It's an interesting group for a couple of reasons. Before I go into the three players, two notes. Number one, they're all from Florida, and they're all high school kids. Just wanted to bring that up. Joshua Farmer, D-tackle. Darius Washington, offensive tackle. Defensive end, Patrick Payton. I'm just going to go through them statistically and give a little bit of a background on why I think Norvell and his staff picked them. This isn't like deep, deep stuff, but I'm going to give a little bit of an anticipation and some theories as to why he picked these three. He could have went with a lot of guys. And we're going to discuss what it means. So if you look at it too, by the way, they're all in the trenches. I've been talking about this for a long time. If Florida State's going to get back to the true top, they're like a, a tier two team by the tradition rich analysis of it. I have them tier one, but that's another story. They got to go up a notch in the trenches. They're close, but he's going to rely on these three and some other guys to get them over the top to truly be a national title game kind of team this year or any other. They've got veterans that have come through the system from the state of Florida, all kinds of backgrounds. It's a pretty interesting group. So mm -hmm. here are the stats for each player. Then I'll talk about each one of them too. Joshua Farmer last year, 32 tackles, seven tackles for loss, five sacks, two pass breakups, two quarterback hurries, and a forced fumble. Offensive tackle Darius Washington, 470 snaps, 89.1% pass blocking. This is by pro football focus. That's really good. 68.7 run blocking. That's the area that Darius needs to work on the most. But the stat that Denver goes out of style, zero sacks. Um, I don't know any offensive line coach that will complain about that. That's a really, really hard thing to do. I don't care if you're playing against a directional school, FCS school, or anything else. That is still a player across from you that is getting a scholarship of some kind to play football, to not give up a sack all year, and he had 470 snaps. It's not like Darius didn't play a lot. He is a very talented player. He was banged up part of the year, split some reps, et cetera, but that's an excellent player. He could be a guy that gets drafted. We'll, we'll come back to him, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Finally, out of the three, Patrick Payton, kid out of Miami, Florida, 44 tackles last year, 14 and a half tackles for loss, seven sacks, and the most important stat, quite honestly, 10 pass breakups. Like his length, Patrick's really good. He gets football with anticipation and using his brain. Yeah, he's athletically gifted. He's got length like a tree, but you're not going to maximize it if you don't think. Darius does a great job in pass protection and anticipating. Patrick on the other side is just the same, but in opposite direction. He, he figures out what's going to happen next, and that's why he's successful. I'm sure they have some great battles in practice. He also had seven hurries and two forced fumbles. Again, all three are from Florida, all are linemen, all are kids that are high school. Final point about that with the high school, there's no doubt what the negative recruiting Miami does and some other schools – Florida State's a portal school, blah, blah, blah. There's some truth to that, but really, it's it's old. But you can't tell me that Norvell didn't pick three kids, A, that are in-state, and B, they're all high school. That's somewhat intentional. Again, they're all linemen. Now, as for expectations and whatnot, there are a lot of ways you can look at that. But we're, we're going to talk about development specifically with these guys and a couple other players in just a moment to finish up the show. But the expectations – are different at Florida State and how they develop. And again, I'll get into more specifics momentarily. But these are guys he's bringing to represent Florida State. So that tells me a couple of things. Number one, they're going to class, they're going to workouts, they're consistent. You're not going to bring guys that aren't leaders to the ACC media day, period. The first game of the year is the 24th of August. They're playing Georgia Tech and Dublin, Ireland. They, they are going to be hitting it hard here in about a week or so. Florida State's fall camp will start earlier because of the scenario of playing the game overseas, I think that Patrick Payton and all these guys, the veterans that have went through the trench warfare and all the offseason 
is why I picked him in addition to what I mentioned. And I also think that will, all those stats that I just mentioned, all of them will have maybe in different ways better seasons this year, or Norvell wouldn't have brought them. And B, they might even be more clutch. Think about this. Just Let's just use Patrick Payton for an example. Northwestern High School, he's like the 155th player in the nation coming out of high school, but he was a little in terms of a D-line. He was like 205, 210 coming out of high school, but he was 6'5". His potential was really high. He had a ton of offers, decides to go to Florida State. He has toiled through the ranks, redshirted, played a little bit as a redshirt freshman in his last year, even with verse, it was a race to the quarterback. Now the pressure is going to be on Patrick to a certain degree because, I mean, no way around it. You're not going to replace Jared Verse with one guy. He was a special football player. That's fine. Patrick Payton means a lot to the program because they're always going to recruit Miami Northwestern and down that area anyway, the Miami Public League, the private schools like American Heritage, et cetera, in Broward County. But he's also a kid they developed from scratch. He's a kid they handpicked and recruited. He's a kid that Florida State – has given a chance to, and he's adhered to it. This is what being a developmental program generically is. It's important. All of those things mean that he has a chance to be very good as a senior. I assume he'll turn pro after this year, but he would technically have another year of eligibility for whatever reason he wanted to come back as a fifth year. Jared Verse did it. I mean, you never know. So this is what I think Norvell wants, ideally speaking, long term. Doesn't mean that it will happen every year. Doesn't mean that it's always going to work out that way. Some of these guys just take a flyer and they're okay with being a fifth or sixth round pick after a redshirt sophomore season. Not the smartest thing, but Peyton didn't do that. As for guys like Washington and Farmer, like Farmer's from Gadsden County High School. It's right down the street, basically, from Tallahassee. It's like half hour or 20 minutes or something like that. I, I can't remember the distance, but it's not very far. He's a kid that wasn't ranked that high. I think BC was his only other offer. That's a kid that it's interesting that he's picking him. I think he's showing respect. Like, you guys are doing it the way I would want. That's important, I think, to Norvell, because I really believe he enjoys, as most coaches do, the ability to bring kids in and see them work all the way through. Now, some of these kids, they weren't here, or they were here before Mike, and they stuck around. So that's the other part. Like, Peyton was the beginning of the run. Farmer, a little bit different. Washington, you know, that – those guys are coming in right at the same time. And it's interesting that they've all adapted to Norvell and his staff regardless. Very good sign. I, I think continuity is the biggest thing that Florida State football has going for it. Now, recruiting is getting better, but they still take a lot of three-star guys and build them up. They take guys that were three-stars, went to other schools, did okay, transferred in too. So it's the same thing. And they've been successful either way. Development, development, development. With that, that is going to be the main topic. And I'm going to talk about these guys and a couple other guys. It's just amazing what Florida State has been able to do in terms of coaching to get players up to a very high level. That's next on Locked On Simmons. Off the top of your head, without looking at a roster or a Florida State depth chart, now, I've talked about Darius Washington, Joshua Farmer, Patrick Payton. They've all developed at Florida State from high school ranks. Name at least two more players on the roster for this fall that were brought in by the Knowles that aren't just good from the high school ranks, but they developed, and they didn't necessarily have to be an elite kid. You can pick whatever you want. But think about whatever that those players are, how they – maybe it's a redshirt fresh kid, played a little, a little bit in that burst moment. Like, okay, this guy is – He's arrived. Florida State has a lot of guys like that. In the trench, it's easier to say the skill guys because they get the ball. But it's happened in the trenches quite a bit. That's important, too. There's some balance. But just as a point, the kid that and I remember going to see him in high school, Tofili, I was living in the Tampa area, so it was easy to go see him. He played at Pinellas Park High School. It's in the greater Clearwater, St. Pete area. And I forget which team they were playing. It might have been Largo or something like that. It was a pretty good game. And I knew from watching him on film that he was fast. But there's a difference. Seeing a young man alive and seeing him at an Under Armour camp or even seeing him on film, like Under Armour camps, they can't hit. There were a couple of plays where he got hit hard, 
bounced sideways, kept his balance, and just immediately put the foot in the ground. It's the ultimate test of speed. It's like, holy moly. This kid's explosiveness is different. Like, under our camps, give me some idea of speed. But there's nothing like a lot of competition where you got the full pads on. Can you outrun somebody when you're getting hit play after play? Because they ran a lot of inside stuff at his high school. For whatever reason, I thought they should have run him outside a little more. But there was one play where Topili broke a tackle and took a step to the left. And, like, the guy thought he had an angle at it. Wrong. And he scooted away from him in about two steps. And it's just something that's God-given you cannot teach. So feel his speed was that way. And that's why he had offers from programs all over the place. He was a top 250 recruit. Uh, Alabama, Auburn, Ford, a bunch of schools offered to feel out of high school, if you don't remember, didn't know. And I can see why. But he still didn't just come in and play right away. And Florida State's had a lot of good running backs the last few years. They've had struggles until the last two seasons, headed into 24. But running back hasn't exactly been the biggest problem. They've had good running backs. They've got a really good run scheme. And so Philly's taking his time. He hasn't complained. He hasn't been a guy, even with the transfer portal, that ended up leaving. He could. Um, can you imagine how many different schools tried to get to Philly to transfer? Are you kidding me? Let's not kid ourselves here. This is this is a kid that had opportunities. There's no doubt. He's a good in pass game. He could be a slot. He could do a lot of different things for your football team. And Florida State's obviously taking advantage of that too. This is a developmental situation with an elite player. Again, he had, he had like Bama offer for it, offer like he pretty much go where he wanted. And they still brought him along at the pace they needed to and implemented him into the passing game, into the run game, and even pass blocking when he was ready. It's just coaching. Florida State develops high school players very well. There may not be a better representative of that on this year's roster than Lawrence Tolfield. You can make the argument. Not saying it's the only one, but it's certainly in the discussion. Again, he was really good in high school, all the recruiting rankings and all that. So that, that's something to think about. Here's another way to look at it. This is the war daddy of war daddies. Maurice Smith, class of 2019 from Miami Central. He's a kid that was not recruited that heavily, BC, Florida State, and then a lot of smaller school, Appalachian State, et cetera. Goes to Florida State, has been injured quite a bit. Last year he played injured for a lot of the year. He's going to be a sixth-year senior this season. He has been Florida State through and through when they were not very good. 2019, 2020, things weren't real great at Florida State. Let's not kid ourselves. He's made it happen, and he's made Florida State better. Good for him. Going to have degrees. He's going to have an opportunity maybe to get drafted. We'll see. He needs to stay healthy this year if he's going to get drafted. But he's a center. He's about 300 pounds. It's a good football player, and he represents Florida State from a developmental standpoint, from a guy that not that many people want. Now, Bowden usually had like one guy or something like this on the roster, but they were recruiting at a whole different level back in the day. I don't know if they'd offered Smith. They, they may not have. But this shows you that Florida State figured it out. And even though he came before Norvell, this is a guy that's a dude that has figured it out overall how to find his niche, play guard, center, whatever. I just want to play and is making the line calls and leading a team that offensively wasn't a whole lot to fun to play against the last couple of years. He was the guy every play. That is why I'm glad to see him come back and get a chance. It's unfortunate he got banged up as much as it did. Or he might have went to the NFL. Who knows? But that's a great example. And then finally, Darius Washington. This is This is a great thing to think about here. Pensacola is overlooked in recruiting a lot of the time. I got a buddy that coaches over in that area. It's frustrating for him. He has to take guys a few more places and stuff like that to get him recognized, but he's built up his clientele, Florida State included. He talks Florida State quite a bit. Some of these guys get overlooked. Darius was not. He had several offers, Miami, UCF, Mississippi State, et cetera, in addition to the Knowles. Goes to Florida State from Florida Tech. It's in Pensacola. And – He's done a really good job of working his way up. But he was a little higher recruited than like Smith was, to say the least. But he still had to wait his turn, and he's still been banged up at points. He had a few games that he wasn't as dominant last year, because like the Clemson game, the offensive line was beat up pretty bad. And it was Clemson. Like their front seven was nasty. And he still persevered and continued to play, did a good job down the stretch when he was a little healthier. I think this is another example. They need guys like this. They can't miss on Pensacola kids. Florida State's done a pretty good job. 
they need to get even more. I just want to bring that up. And Darius is another example. Even though in-state four-star recruit O-line, it's still a little different. Norvell and his staff have developed these kids out of the high school ranks. It's very important. You've got to get some of the big bodies out of Florida. It's not the greatest state for O-line, but there's still a lot of them because states are big. you got to get one or two at least a year. Darius Washington has a chance to get drafted after this season. He trusts in Florida State. This is a chance. I mean, he could be a second second day pick. I don't know if he's going to have to go first round. He's not a six seven kid. He's six four. But his development is very very important for the Knowles in recruiting to continue to recruit like they are this year. They're doing much better with the O line recruit. They're on a much higher trajectory with elite level prospects. This is a kid that is a great example. Hey, look where he was. He didn't play that much right out the gate, but we've developed him, and now he's a really good football player. And he's going to go to the National Football League. But you know they're using that as a tool anytime they go meet with Solomon Thomas or Texas Solomon, anybody they're recruiting. That's one of the things they're going to do. So, with that, I'm going to wrap it up today. So please hit that like button, hit that subscribe, rate and review this podcast. I truly appreciate you coming back and seeing us once again on Locked On Seminoles. It's going to be an interesting week. We're going to talk a little bit about what Norvell said and whatnot on Monday night or on Tuesday morning, might, might be able to get another one in tomorrow night. I'm curious what Mike has to say. There's a lot of different topics they're going to ask him about. It, it's going to be unique. Everybody have a great one. Talk to you again soon.